Hey, Roger, I've got one for you. Professional Woodworkers Personality Aptitude Test. This came from Dan. He writes, Since there are many of us who have up until now dabbled in many different things. For me, it's been hand tools, carving, chair making, and now restoration. But aren't sure which one to dive into as a side hustle. I wonder if you have, over the years, noticed certain patterns and personality type that gravitate towards certain aspects of the trade. Thank you, Dan, for that question. And it is an excellent question, because many of you who are listening to Working at Woodworking Podcast probably have asked yourself the same thing. It's hard to decide, A, if you want to actually do this as a side gig or even full-time, and then B, what exactly am I going to do? And so Dan's trying to unpack this a little bit. Well, any time that I need to learn something, we do what everyone does, and we go ask Mr. Google. And Mr. Google says, Woodworkers tend to be predominantly artistic individuals, meaning that they are creative and original and work well in a setting that allows for self-expression. They also tend to be investigative, which means that they are quite inquisitive and curious people that often like to spend time alone with their thoughts. That comes from CareerExplorer.com. I will also add that they are rarely seen in the wilds outside of their own particular dens. Sometimes they will congregate together, but usually they are solitary. Now, I'm not a psychologist, sociologist, meteorologist, but yeah, Dan, I have kind of observed a few traits that seem to be common. I think one of the first traits is kind of an age breakdown. And a lot of this, granted, is coming from what I see on YouTube. It it seems like, you know, the the, the younger woodworkers are fit, young, usually tall, and full of energy. And then I see other woodworkers who are typically older, not quite so fit, very, very often bearded, and a little more laid back. Now, also remember, when we're trying to come up with some type of a personality profile here, we're looking at a woodworker, which in the U.S. typically most people think of it as a as a hobby, but we're also looking at an entrepreneur, a small business owner. So those two kind of combine. I would say right off the top of my head, the number one trait would be they are independent. They're doing this totally on their own. They don't have anyone, you know, in the background cracking the whip. This is something they've decided to do and they're charging forward. And with that, they are very much a self-starter. There's really no class that you can go to or program you can sign up for on on how to go about doing this. So they just kind of decide, yep, I'm going to do this. I'm hoping that working at Woodworking Podcast is helping those folks sort out some of the, well, rough spots that comes along with being a solo entrepreneur. I also think that they're curious. They're always asking themselves, how does that work? Or, hey, why did that happen? (laughs) Oh boy, I screwed that up. So if you get a result that you weren't exactly expecting, you're going to probably try to figure out why that happened. That's why you always test finish, test stain. We're curious on how this stain would look with this finish on the offcut of the piece of wood that we're building the credenza with. They're problem solvers. Hmm, how do I do this? Mr. Google. Or you can dig through your vast library of various woodworking books and magazines and can probably come up with the answer that way. Or you just do it the good old-fashioned way. Uh, Well, let's see if this works. And that problem solver thing, that applies to people just as much as it does to design or construction or joinery or finish or things like that. Very often, 
A person's problem is not the problem that they're presenting, but it's something a little deeper. Maybe some of you remember my story of the lady who hated the color of her kitchen cabinets. And I did a visit and figured out that part of her problem was the 160-watt light bulb that was in her kitchen. Replaced that with a four-bulb fluorescent unit and, ho oh, ho, she loved her kitchen. And I talked myself out of a job. I think they're dedicated. I think woodworkers, particularly professional woodworkers, are very dedicated. This is what we do. They're, they're kind of like musicians. You know, they, they think nothing of sitting around for, for six hours on a Sunday afternoon practicing their instrument. This is what they do. And I'll ask you the question, what would you do if you couldn't do woodworking? If you, for whatever reason, lost your shop? I'll bet that most of you would still figure out a way of doing woodworking. That might be building model ships out of wood or doing dull furniture or chip carving or you would do something that you could do in the environment that you find yourself. I remember from my Navy days, I had a small uh, wood carving set that, you know, we were in port. I'd spend time up on the bridge in the uh, on the chart table um, just carving away. And that was my way of staying connected with wood. And I'll add in here that woodworkers, professional woodworkers, are reasonably good with people. And basically that boils down to communication. Now, being, you know, solitary creatures that tend to stay in their cave, we often don't have a lot of opportunity to practice communication. So whenever we actually get a, a, a live human in our shop, well, okay, sometimes we can, what's the term, um, um, uh, talk their ear off. Yeah, I have really tried to control that. But you do have to communicate with people to figure out what they really want and how you're going to to provide that. And you should also get a sense of the level of communication that's needed for a particular project. There are some people you could say, yeah, I should have that ready for you um, spring of next year. And they're perfectly fine with that. You call them up in May the following year and say, well, I've got your table done. Other people, if you're not sending them like weekly you know, Instagram post on the progress you're making with that, they start to go a little crazy. Or if you're not sending them a, a an email, you know, phone call, they they get really, really antsy. Never, ever, ever take a job that somebody wants daily updates. Nope, don't do that. You know, come to think of it, I am a boxologist. That's a term coined by one of my favorite mentors, Frank Klaus. He says, we're all boxologists. We make boxes. They could be kitchen cabinet boxes or jewelry boxes or boxes that we put books in. Yeah, you're right. We are kind of boxologists. Now, there are experts, psychologists, sociologists, psychiatrists, criminal profilers that do know a lot more about this than, than I do. And I've found a, a website called 16personalities.com. I actually found this on, on lumberjocks.com. That's a, a website forum that if you're not familiar with, it was created like weeks after the internet was and lots and lots of really good information on there. Uh, a bunch of great people. There's a thread, links in the show notes. Um, of people asking this exact question, you know, about personality types of woodworkers. And this person referred to 16personalities.com and did a very informal kind of survey. Some people would go to the website, take the, the survey, and then post, you know, what they got. And honestly, there was nothing really conclusive with it, but it was kind of interesting. Um, 16personalities.com Number one, it's an incredibly good website. 
and the 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 survey that they do yes i did it um really really well done there are some surveys that you just want to you know bash your head in with a mallet uh not this one they they did a really really good job um takes about 10 minutes the questions are laid out incredibly well you don't have to well honestly do a lot of thinking with it um a little caveat is that when you're answering a question, you know, is this how I am or how I would like to be? So that could skew a little thing. Um, turns out I'm an architect. My wife was incredibly impressed. Not really. So what's a, what's an architect? Uh, well, you, you, you go onto the website and it, it lists out some characteristics. And, you know, I think a lot of this is kind of like horoscope. You know, you, you throw something out there and it's going to mean something to somebody. So uh, I, I don't read a whole bunch into it, but it's kind of fun to do. Okay, how about generalities that we could make about woodworkers or people who, who are in the, the trades? Um, yeah, I think that there's definitely some generalities you can make. Um, I would say a fine furniture maker would make an absolutely lousy carpenter. Conversely, I think a carpenter would make an absolutely lousy fine furniture maker. Why is that? Well, it really boils down to your sense of accuracy. You know, a, a carpenter is going to use a carpenter's pencil. You know, if you look at the lead of that, it's it's sixteen inch thick by about a what a eighth of an inch wide. I mean, it is big. And whenever you mark a board, it's a big mark. And that's perfectly fine because a carpenter is not getting down to a 32nd of an inch. You know, eighth of an inch, go. And remember, carpenters get paid by the job. And so they're not going to sit there and futz and fits and, and, and recut something seven times or quote unquote sneak up on the line. No, they're going to just cut the bloody line and keep on going. Because time is money. Speed and accuracy is everything. And if you ever have an opportunity to watch a good carpenter, I mean, it is just art in motion. But if you ask them to build, you know, a set of kitchen cabinets or maybe a cadenza, yeah, that might be a little rough. And I really just think it's kind of that mental thing, you know, the way things are 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 put together. It's it's kind of the you know the MMA fighter uh, professional who is a big stamp collector. You know, there, there's kind of a yin and a yang, the kind of balance thing. At the same time, if you take a cabinet maker or fine woodworker and ask them to do carpentry, you know, build a wood storage shed out back, they're going to take forever because they are going to sneak up on the line they're going to probably use a pencil you know okay do you want to, to leave the line split the line or take the line away oh my god just cut the bloody piece of you know two before and put it in there so there's there's kind of that that just that mental thing and and you know and really we can define these different parts of of woodworking trade you know, the carpenter uses a carpenter pencil. It's big, fat, it's wide, it's flat so that it doesn't roll off the roof. If you need a sixteenth, well, you know how thick that lead is. If you need a half inch, well, you set the carpenter's pencil up on edge. If you need a quarter inch, that's how thick the carpenter's pencil is. So it's, it's incredibly well designed for that. You wouldn't use a carpenter pencil if you're building a set of kitchen cabinets. You're going to use a, a sh regular pencil, a sharpened pencil, fine point pencil, so that you need to cut this here. You can line up the saw tooth on that pencil line, whether you leave it, split it, or take it away, and make the cut. Now, if you're building that credenza out of highly figured maple, well, you're probably using a marking knife. You know, something that is literally leaving a knife edge so that there is no ambiguity. I mean, it is, it's, it's here. That is the knife mark. That's where we're going to cut. So, you know, just various degrees of accuracy depending on, upon the product. 
trim carpenters, I think, are, are a little unique because they can be very, very good woodworkers. But they also have the attributes of a carpenter in that they're not going to take four weeks to trim out this house. Speed, again, is everything. Speed and accuracy. You know, cut to the line. Don't sit there and futz with it, you know, making three cuts whenever you, you put the saw on the line and you make the cut. It either works or it doesn't work. And that, a lot of times, just comes from experience. Can a cabinet maker do trim? Yeah, they can. They're going to be slow at it. They're not going to probably know some of the tricks of the trades or, you know, setting an interior door might be a bit of a challenge for them. But yeah, they could probably figure it out. At the same time, a trim ca carpenter could build a set of kitchen cabinets. Mm, might take them a little longer. Might not have some of the little nuances that an experienced cabinet maker would make. But yeah, yeah, they, they, they could do that. Now, another generality that I have observed, older woodworkers just don't understand young woodworkers. River tables. OMG, what's the attraction? You have some old, rotted scrap wood surrounded by plastic. I just don't get it. Okay, yeah, I kind of get it. And and some of these people who 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 build these things are are just incredible. You know the 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 beach scene where they can use the resins, the different colored resins, and the different techniques to create foam. You know at the beach. I mean it's it's, it's it is incredible. It really is. But yeah, just don't quite get it. Now younger woodworkers. Well, they just don't get geezers, older woodworkers. It's like, why are you doing it that way? There are so many faster, easier ways of doing that. Well, that's because we've always done it this way. And if it works, don't fix it. Now, something I have observed with younger woodworkers is they know technology. And if they don't actually know it, they can figure it out in like 37 seconds. It's incredible. You know, people who grew up with a mouse, they just can do things that we who grew up with Lincoln Logs just cannot or we really, really struggle with it. Now, conversely, I think it's harder to teach younger woodworkers like traditional hand skills like sawing and cutting dovetails because that 100% relies upon repetition. And you get someone, you know, it's like, well, I've made three dovetails. And they look like crap. Well, that's because you haven't made 300 dovetails yet. And there's just that, that repetition thing that I, I think older people understand more or better than, than younger people. And it, it is, I think it's just a development of age. Because, of course, when I was a teenager, I wanted it to be perfect right off the bat. And, you know, I, I was the exact same way. But, you know, as you learn the importance of repetition, you just get better and better. And I, I think this kind of goes back to the, the dedication like a musician. You know, if they're really into this, they're going to practice six, eight hours a day and so that they can get really, really good. And you get really, really good with repetition. Now, older people... I can teach them how to cut dovetails, and they say, okay, thank you, I need to practice a lot more, but I think I'll get pretty good at this. But to try to teach them new technologies, like social media marketing, or computer-aided design, or CNC, it can just be like running into a brick wall. It's just the way the brains work, I guess. I don't know. I'm not a brain neuroscientist, psychologist thingy. Other observations? Um, CNC operators are not real woodworkers. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where's that coming from? Easy. Yeah, that's a good way to start a fight in a woodworker's bar. Okay, okay. It's just a tool. It's just like your festhold domino. Okay, maybe not the best example. But it's a tool. Are there CNC operators who are not woodworkers? Yes. We call them tool and die makers or machinists. 
and they use a tool called a CNC to make a part out of metal. Are there CNC operators who are woodworkers? Absolutely. You know, they're building these beautiful chairs. And I'm not talking about the ones with the joints that interlock. You know, these are real, real, you know, stickly or mid-century modern or something like that, that they happen to use a tool that they can, instead of building a jig and running it through five different machines and seven different processes, they have one tool that they can do some electronic magic that makes the tool do all those processes at once. That's all it is. You know, there are CNC operators who the only thing they use is MDF or maybe, you know, like three or four mil Baltic birch. And they run it through the CNC, then they run it through a laser, or maybe they're just using a laser CNC you know, to to burn something, to make something, to cut something out that they can reassemble. You know, are they woodworkers? Yeah, why not? And one more thing, I think this may be more of a physical trait than, you know, psychological trait. Um, Energy. Young guys and gals, oh my God, they have so much energy. You know, they start off a video. Well, we're going to cut down the trees and clear the land and dig the foundation and pour the footings and lay up the block subwall and then frame out the garage and, you know, now we're onto the roofing. It's like, oh my gosh, I wish I had that type of energy. Uh, when you get older, you, you lose that energy. Um, I, I don't see any real way around it. That's why you don't see any old carpenters because there's a certain age where the body just says nope you're not doing this anymore and it starts to shut down uh, sometimes they become trim carpenters um, you can do that for maybe a few more years you know you're not lugging around like rafters uh, flooring guys and girls your knees are just going to cease to function in that way you can only do 10 squats a day where, you know, these flooring people, they're doing like a thousand squats a day. And uh, it's it's hard. It's rough on the body. And that's why you don't see old people in these type of trades. Now, you do see older people in things like furniture making, furniture repair, furniture restoration. You've got a lady who brings in an 1890 stickly and guy or gal looks at it and says, oh, my mom had one just like this. (laughs) You know, it's kind of like fossils fixing fossils. So there you go. That's kind of my take on personality traits. As far as picking a particular discipline within woodworking, I really think that kind of comes down to your interest and the opportunity that is presented. You know, you might get into wooden ship model building incredibly talented people that can charge an incredible amount of money for some of these things. But remember, there's probably like six people like that in the entire United States. So it's not something that you see on every street corner. That's why it's called a niche. Maybe you're into antique looms or spinning wheels or harp carts. Yes, I said harp carts. That's the thing. There was a person in in my community, he was like the world-renowned harp cart maker. And he passed away, and I guess that there was just this this huge glut in harp carts that I don't know anything about harp carts. I can't make you a harp cart. I've, like, seen two harps. So it's kind of what you're connected with, what you're into that those niches start to start to get created and and labels i mean really if you are if you say that you are a custom woodworker that kind of means you can do like almost anything you know you we we, we don't really need you know labels you know as as you know pat flynn says you do you and dispense with the labels so recommendations this week there's a 16personalities.com link in the show note, and I also refer to the uh, the Lumberjocks link in the show notes. Missed jobs, uh, email from a lady who said that they have a, it looks like a 1970s end table 
um, that they no longer like the looks of it. The, the finish is kind of worn. Wanting to know if they can, if that can be stained darker or maybe even painted. Uh, she also then threw in, oh yeah, I have a whole bunch of kitchen cabinets that are kind of in the same situation. You know, can those be stained darker, refinished, or should we paint them? Well, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to take on that type of job, so I so I passed. Questions, please. I'm lazy. It's a lot of work to come up with, with topics for this, especially now. To be honest with you, I've kind of run through the entire catalog. So if you have questions, please send them to me. You can email me at roger at working at woodworking.com. You can also uh, give me a phone call, check the show notes or the uh, uh, working at woodworking.com website, and let me know what you're thinking. Special thanks to listeners in Houston, Texas, USA, and also in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Greatly appreciate it. I'm, I'm fascinated by the number of listeners. I, I greatly appreciate everyone. And it's just so much fun to go through the, the stats and look at the locations and you can see all the different countries and the number of listeners and, and so on and so forth. Just a, a whole bunch of fun. It's such a hoot. Uh, affiliate links. I know that I'm kind of deficient on this. I probably don't hit it as hard as I'm supposed to. Um, buy me a cup of coffee is, uh, one of the affiliate links that you can find that like five bucks cup of coffee. That really helps, honestly, because there are some expenses with, with doing a podcast. And I have rebuilt my, my websites and I'm back to PayPal. I tried different things and it was a learning experience. And just to kind of keep things simple, I've rebuilt everything with PayPal. Hope they don't get stupid again. And I also created a uh, donation button using PayPal that you can find. It actually refers to my business, Hoosier Woodworks. Don't let that throw you. It's it's still the same thing. I kept the logo and so on and so forth. Uh, and there's um, uh, Taylor Tools and also the Voice Over IP Unitel. So until next episode, happy woodworking. <laughs>